we're talking about subclavian steel syndrome, we're primarily talking about some narrowing in the subclavian vessels. And if you understand some kind of fundamentals about the anatomy here, this actually makes a lot of sense. In this image, we have our aortic arch. We have our descending aorta back here. And this is the subclavian artery. And we have our common carotid artery. This would be the left common carotid artery. We have our right brachiocephalic trunk, right common carotid artery. And then we also have the right subclavian artery over here and the right vertebral artery coming off of the right subclavian artery. Okay, now the point here is just to make this simple, if I have really bad stenosis here, somewhere in this proximal subclavian artery, if I have trouble getting blood through that subclavian artery, what will happen? Well, what can happen is the vertebral arteries branch off of the subclavian artery. And if they're branching off distal to this area of stenosis, I would suspect that this area that's distal to the obstruction will have a much lower pressure. Okay, so the pressure in this area is gonna be much lower because I'm not able to get a lot of blood through here. So what can happen is I can get some blood from this right side of the body, okay, and we can get some reversal of blood flow or retrograde flow back down the left vertebral artery and then I can kind of fulfill this pressure gradient because I lost this pressure because I had some area of stenosis here. And this pressure gradient will cause some of this blood from this vertebral artery to actually come down the other way if there's you know significant enough stenosis here. And so what would cause this stenosis? Well, first off, atherosclerosis is a big one. So patients that have hyperlipidemia, a history of coronary artery disease would be very classic, Takayasu arteritis, and any previous aortic surgery. Like if a patient had coarctation or they had a narrowing here before and they had a surgery and now maybe there's some fibrosis there, that can do it. But the big one that I want you to remember, if you can only remember one of these, is atherosclerosis. That's very classically going to be the cause of subclavian steel syndrome. So how do you know in a question that a patient has subclavian steel syndrome? Well, usually they're going to have limb ischemia that worsens when they have activity of the affected limb. So you can imagine when this patient's moving their left arm around, that's gonna have increased oxygen requirements. And if you can't get blood past this obstruction, well, then this blood from the vertebral system is going to come down to kind of fulfill that oxygen requirement. However, the problem here is if you're taking blood away from the vertebrobasilar system, you end up with vertebrobasilar insufficiency. And so these patients, because they have decreased perfusion up here, now they're gonna get dizzy, they might have diplopia, they might have episodes of syncope, and this is all going to be you know, classically in the presentation of increased activity of the affected limb. These patients also, because they have this area of stenosis here, they'll have uh, decreased radial pulses, for example, they might have asymmetric blood pressures. And just to help you visualize this, I mean, in a lot of board questions now, you have to, you know, at least interpret some imaging. And so what we have here is the ascending aorta, we have the aortic arch, and then we have the descending aorta. Here you can see, I want you to try and guess what some of these structures are. What do you think this is? It's gonna be the brachiocephalic trunk, right? And you have your subclavian, you have your right common carotid. Here you can see the left common carotid, right? Branching off on its own. And then this is the left subclavian. And you can see that there's almost this white out area here. That's from the decreased perfusion or the stenosis. And then we do have a little bit of blood getting through, but then it kind of just dies off here. So we have decreased perfusion. The other thing is, remember, the left subclavian artery is going to have the uh, branch for the vertebral artery but we really can't see any vertebral artery here. And that might be due to the retrograde flow. If I'm injecting contrast right here, and that contrast is going into the aortic vessels, right? I would expect to get some of that contrast coming up through the vertebral artery, but I don't see any of that. I don't see a vertebral artery here. And so that might be because of the retrograde flow. Now you can see when they put this balloon in to open this up, right? They open this space up. And when they opened it up, you can see now there's flow going through the subclavian vessel. And now I have a vertebral artery here that's having appropriate uh, blood flow, which is it's going anterograde at this point. Okay, so again, you don't have to be an expert at reading angiograms or anything like that, but it's important to understand the basics of what's going on because it's the mechanisms, the pathogenesis that you really want to understand. So again, I wrote that here, reduce contrast uptake in areas distal to stenosis, right? Because you have a narrowing, so you're not able to get the contrast beyond the narrowing and also in the ipsilateral vertebral artery because of the retrograde flow.